Welcome to this episode of Patient Perspectives in HCV, a CE podcast series. If you are seeking continuing education credit, please review the front matter for disclosures and the requirements for successful completion of the activity prior to listening to the podcast. A link is found in the show notes that can direct you to this information. After listening to the podcast, please go to practice.cme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit. Thank you for your attention. The podcast will now begin. I'm Dr. Tony Martinez from the University of Buffalo and Erie County Medical Center, and I'm here with my patient of many years, Lindsay, uh, who's talking to me about her life experiences with hepatitis C. Um, Lindsay, in this second episode, we want to take a, a deeper dive into the initial, your initial reaction when you were diagnosed. Okay. Um, when you got the news that you were positive, you know, what did you feel? What was the first thing that came to mind? Honestly, I felt dirty. Um, you know, and it's, I feel horrible saying that now. Um, but at that time, you know, I was just so broken. Um, and, you know, it kind of just made me feel defeated. Like, even though I knew that there was treatment out there, um, I just felt like, you know, because where I was in my life that this could probably be a factor of me not being able to live my life anymore. Um, and like I said, I didn't want to pass it to anybody. Um, so I just, I just felt lost. Yeah. And you referenced in, in the, the first uh, episode that you felt it was like a death sentence, I think is what you said about it. Yeah. You know, what, what, how, Kind of explain your headspace around that. Did you know treatment was available? I did know treatment was available, um, but I also knew some things about my family. Um, you know, my sister, my biological sister, she unfortunately passed away at 28 of cancer. Um, and I know that when you don't treat hepatitis C, it can turn to liver cancer. Um, and in my eyes, you know, I didn't see an out of getting out of addiction. I thought that the rest of my life was going to be me using needles and injecting drugs into my body. And that's how I was going to die. So um, whether it was going to be from an overdose or whether it was going to be from the direct result of addiction and me not taking care of myself, um, I just kind of felt like maybe this is just something that, you know, is meant to be. And so I'm the hep C was just like one more match on the fire. Right. Right. You know, in this smoldering. Right. Yeah, I definitely didn't see an out at that time. Um, you know, like I said before, I was in MAT treatment and that wasn't working for me. Um, I actively used every single day I went for MAT treatment. Um, I chose to use other substances other than just um, IV drug use, um, other than just heroin, I should say. You know, I intravenously used cocaine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used crack cocaine. Um, I drank alcohol. So I knew that all that stuff on top of what I was doing on top of going to MAT, you know, I'm like, if this isn't working for me, I guess I'm just going to die a drug addict, an active use drug addict. You felt like, hopeless. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On many days. And on many days I didn't want to use, I just couldn't stop. And did you, did you know much? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about what you knew about hep C you know, kind of the basics of how it spread, things like that. But had you received much harm reduction? Um, as far as like treatment? As far as spreading it to others? Um, not really. Um, not, no. Um, like I said, because of where I was going for my MAT treatment at the time, you know, they, I, I'm going to be completely honest. The only reason why I even considered getting tested at the clinic that I was at was because they offered to pay the patients. To get tested, to, to get, get screened for hep C. Yes. And really? Yes. So there so was screening a, in that setting, in that particular MAT clinic that you were at that time. engaged in, screening wasn't a, a routine thing. No, no. Really? Um, they were just introducing it. Um, I, they said that, um, you know, if you choose to do this study, you'll be paid for your services for coming in and getting tested and then doing the treatment if you're found to be positive. 
And in my mind at the time I was using, and I was like, well, this is way to get money to use more drugs. So that's why I you took the it. test. Yes. Wow. It, you know, in the U.S., we mentioned that about two and a half million people have hep C and 50 percent of people who have it don't actually know their status. Mm -hmm. And the main reason being that they haven't been tested. Right. And, you know, hep C is often asymptomatic. If you have any symptoms, maybe it's some fatigue and joint pain. But if you're right. living the life, you don't, it, feel you don't anything even anyway. you know. Yeah. You, you, you have all these other symptoms of, of drug use and withdrawal and all these things that you don't feel like mentioned. Right. And if you're a person who injects drugs, the treatment uptake historically has been less than 20%, mm -hmm. which is astounding when you think about all the people who have hep C, drug users are disproportionately affected by it. And we have 55,000 new cases of hep C per year that are primarily spread by injection drug use, yet less than 20% of patients have been engaged in the treatment. And I think that your experience in the early days here kind of highlights some of why that is. We see these breakdowns in that cascade from diagnosis to treatment initiation. And here you were in an MAT clinic, not even being screened mm -hmm. without some incentive to do it, right. uh, which is interesting. So they drew the blood and they came back. Did they make you get a second blood draw to confirm it? Or Yes, yes. So you had did. to get the two blood draws. Yes. Yes. Um, and then they, and every time I was seen by them, they paid me. Um, I can't exactly remember. I think it was $25. So you were incentivized to come right, and, right. and do it. Um, but then when we got to the part of treatment, like I said before, they said, well, we're not going to treat you until you give us cleaning taxes. So they incentivize you to be screened and to have the blood to then be told you're not el eligible right. to be treated until you're abstinent for six months. Right. And they wanted me to go to a rehab to get clean. And of course, at that time, um, I had my youngest daughter, I had custody of her and I was living in an abusive relationship with her father. And I was not willing to leave her with him to go to treatment. Um, I just made excuses and said, I'll get clean on my own. Don't worry about it. And then I'll continue this treatment. And of course that never happened. And meanwhile, you're still actively using. Right. And were you sharing with other people? Um, I was not, I was not sharing needles. I was using the needle exchange program okay. at that time. Um, you know, at the time I was living um, in Niagara Falls um, and you know, I came for my MAT treatment in Erie County. Um, there is a needle exchange program in Erie County. And sometimes I would go there, but they had a mobile needle exchange that would come out to Niagara Falls once a week. So I would go there once a week and get works and, you know, not share. My problem was, is a lot of times I would reuse my old dirty needles. Yeah. And, you know, obviously that's not sanitary and that's not yeah. good. Um, but if I was sick and that was the only thing that was there, that's what I was going to do. So a lot of times we hear from either providers or even patients that, you know, they offer harm reduction. And a lot of times it, it just focuses on using a clean needle mm -hmm. and that's it. It kind of ends there. Um, and there's people I'm sure that are listening to this that may not understand that it's more than that. Right. right? I mean, when you prepare heroin or cocaine, when you inject drugs, there's usually a cooker, so right. a spoon or a bottle cap, water, water involved, there's lighters, Alcohol. there's tie downs, right? And hep C can survive on all of those surfaces. Right. So when we provide the harm reduction, me you know, messaging, it's more than just use a clean needle, change a syringe, don't share. It's all the works. It's right. all of that stuff that we have to make sure that we uh, counsel and educate on so that, you know, people, uh, they can possibly get infected from those right. implements of use. So you mentioned in the first, in the first segment that stigma was a big thing for you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, where did that rank in, you know, of all the barriers with hep C having to be abstinent for six months and all this other stuff, where did the stigma piece rank for you? Um, you know, and I think my initial, my initial thoughts and feelings on it is, it was one of the main reasons, um, you know, for me to be actively using and to still think my first initial thought was like, okay, I feel dirty. 
Um, I think that that just comes from, you know, even when you talk to people that don't have family members in addiction or, you know, don't know somebody, which is very, it's very rare nowadays, yeah. but, um, you know, they initially think about the, the homeless person that's underneath a bridge that's using needles or, you know, underneath a bridge with, with a bottle. Um, so I just felt, I felt dirty and I got that perception from what I learned growing up and stuff like that. Um, and what I found was that that's far, you know, far from it. Um, yeah. Yeah, this this addiction touches every everybody. demographic, right. rich, poor, right. every ethnicity, every gender, you know, every insurance, it doesn't matter, it, right. it touches everyone. Right. And, you know, I've, in my many times of trying to, you know, get treatment in different facilities, you know, I met people from all walks of life. Um, and I met people that, you know, were in law enforcement, I met people that were, you know, attorneys um and people that you wouldn't at the time you would never think would go towards addiction um and i think that a lot of times if they would just educate people more on you know how addiction does happen and that it's not a choice that the stigma can can be taken away um you know i've been clean for some time now and one thing that I learned is like, you know, don't judge anybody yeah. um, because you never know what that person might be going through. Um, you know, I'm not confused about the fact that, you know, even though I do have some clean time, like I could go back to that lifestyle at any time if I don't work on myself. Um, and I know that there's so many different pathways to recovery. You know, there's no cookie cutter model of a recovering addict. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's just education. Like yeah. it's the biggest thing. Um, you raised some really important points. And the one that I think I want to just highlight is that addiction, I think what, what I'm hearing from you is something that a lot of us in the field have long held to that, you know, addiction is a chronic disease state. Mm -hmm. And it's on par with every other disease. It's, it's, you know, it's like diabetes and right. hypertension and, and you manage it. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily curable, right? And it's not that you become abstinent from using and you're fixed, right? right? You still have traumas and you still have things that you went through and lived through and biology, we mentioned genetics. And mm -hmm. even if your life is in a better place, you still have this stuff that's in there that a lot, you know, we can't undo it, right? right? We can't change it. It's, it's something that you, you have to live with. And I think that you raise an important point that, you know, you have to, you, you continue to do that work on yourself, but that it's never gone. Right. 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 I think, uh, I, I think it's fascinating how, you know, you've taken us this far and, and you've been diagnosed now with hep C and the next stage is treatment. And so in our next segment, in episode three, we're going to talk more about uh, your feelings on going through treatment and what you were worried about before starting and, and how that part of the journey looks. So hopefully uh, folks will join us for episode three. Thank you for listening. Please go to the activity page on practicepointcme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit.